Showtime. Hey, welcome everybody. Jeff Frick coming to you from the home studio. Great to see you today. We're really excited to have uh, a really industry luminary, really excited to, to meet her recently, uh, kind of through the Athena Alliance, but in, in digging through and, and looking into her background, a very interesting person, a lot of experience, and I'm excited for today's conversation. So we welcome in uh, via the magic of Zoom and the internet, Michelle uh, Betancourt. She is the executive chairperson at Corelight. Michelle, great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad we we're able to, to, to make it work out. So we met through Coco Brown at the Athena Alliance. I'm a huge fan of Coco. Happened to, you know, a circumstance interview, I think when she first started the Athena Alliance and it, it's, you know, one of the classic overnight, overnight success, you know, six years in the making recently changed from being a nonprofit to a profit center. And I know you now are getting very involved with the organization. How did you hear about Athena? What, what attracted you to them? Great question. So uh, my, I ran a company called uh, Coverity and my head of HR went on to another company called User Testing. And she asked me to come in and speak as a guest about me and my experiences in life, which I did. And then she introduced me to Coco. And, and then in, in that, Coco invited me to, uh, to, to present at a, at a recruiting conference that, that, that uh, Athena had partnered with. So I was part of the, the round table following the keynote and I also had a separate session with my ex head of HR. I was um, so happy to be there. It was kind of my coming out party, if you will, um, as, as Michelle in front of tech folks, right? broader group of tech folks. And um, then uh, over time I joined, I, jo I joined the Alliance. I was honored right. to, be, to be invited. And you wrote this very nice, um, let me pull it up here. You wrote this really nice blog post. Let's see if I can pull it up through the magic again of too much technology. Yeah, Coco yeah. and I talked about this and, and I, my wife and I had talked about this separately and that um, I've been married for 20, almost 28 years. And my wife made the comment, it's kind of not fair of you to transition and take other jobs. It's, it's, there, there's an element of that that she, that my wife found distasteful. And I kind of, I appreciated that. So I talked to Coco about that and said, I don't want to use the Athena Alliance to get a job. I don't need that. Right. I've, I've, I've been really fortunate and I still have a, a bunch of white privilege in me, even, even regardless of my current appearance. Um, but, but let me help. Let, let me, let me be a mentor. Let, let me uh, teach salons because I've got a lot of experience in running companies and, and being a board director. So we agreed that that's what I'm doing. So I, I do a, probably about a salon a quarter and, and take a lot of other calls from Athena Alliance members who are curious about how, what does it take to get on a board or become a CEO, those kinds of things. Right. And then what's the topic of the, what's kind of the format of the salons? I've never been, I've never been in one. Um, they're, they're all pretty different. One was, uh, here's, here's how you go, here's how to sell a tech company. In other words, these are the steps you go through, the prescriptive test steps to go sell it. I'm doing one on Feb 4, and that is uh, how to build and manage your board. So I, I, I kind of choose topics of which I have a, a decent amount of experience, good and bad. And it an easy roundtable format. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide Coco with, you know, 20 talking points. She'll ask questions and I'll riff. And then we make sure we have enough questions, time as well for the audience to ask questions. Right, right. So let's talk about your career a little bit. You are, um, we talked before we turn the cameras on, really about going in and, and turning, turning problem companies around. And you've done it multiple times, many, 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 many times. So, you know, you're not coming in as a founder. You're coming into a situation which is not terrific. And we hear all the time that that's a great thing to do from a career point of view, right? Take the shitty jobs that nobody else wants to take. Um, what would you attribute your success to? What was kind of your strategy going into these difficult situations? Because um, you know, I've seen, I've seen you speak a little bit and, you know, you were tough, you know, do you have, do you have real data behind you or, or, or should I throw a dartboard? I think was the line I picked up somewhere along the line, but where, you know, kind of what was your philosophy? You've done it a number of times. How did you, how did you turn these things around? Oh, look, a lot of it was just observing. I, I, um, I was in a company called Verity. I was, uh, I was their VP of sales and we had a shakeup in the company that, that, uh, bothered me. I left for a while and I came back with the new team. And, and when I came back with that new team, we were near bankrupt and we had about, we had recorded a $5 million quarter of revenue and a $10 million loss as a public company. It had about 12 million in the bank left. So we, we would have been un, uh, down and out at 90 days had we not gotten the re result. But the team, they, they brought in a turnaround team called Regent Pacific and a gentleman named Gary Sabona. And I'll, I've always been very fortunate to work with or work for or work around really interesting folks that have a lot of skills that I don't have. Gary was a turnaround expert. He taught me an awful lot about 
how to approach a problem, um, uh, you know, kind of how to organize or, uh, people and how to deal with a, going into an organization where you're you're not trusted. Right. And, right. And, and, and look, and I'm also I, I work with, I work with Mike Lynch of Autonomy, and and I learned a lot from Mike in terms of just things don't burn down all at once. So there's you can make systematic changes in companies if you make them quickly and 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 if you communicate, and you're not going to break everything at once. And I, so it was it was a combination of of a lot of observation and then having a chance at Verity to do it on my own. Right, right. And then you said you come up through the sales side. So you approach everything really from a, with a sales hat on from a sales perspective or revenue perspective, correct? Uh, yeah, I would say a, a customer facing perspective per se. So it's customers, it's our, it's our organization, it's investors, it's partners, it's stakeholders. And, and look, my, my career is a bit of, a, of an accident. I was I, at, I dropped out of college at age 21. I, I wanted to be a technical writer. My father was a, was a wonderful man, a manual laborer and didn't have the, uh, the opportunity to go to college and, and made about 17,000 a year. I'm 60 years old. So I graduated high school in 1978. My dad's best year was 17 grand that year. So I went out to Santa Clara, was ill-equipped, had terrible grades, quit going. I was just embarrassed. I was, I was a terrible student and ended up working for um, a company called Dysan, which was a disk a disc drive manufacturer, um, then went to Altos for my first real job. And when I went to Altos, I dropped out of Santa Clara. And I didn't know what I, I didn't know what I didn't know, which right. is an advantage because I, I was never encumbered by the lack of my own skills, if you will. It's fun. It, it's funny. And in, in, in a lot of the stuff that you've got published, you talk about how young you were at, at some of these, you know, really critical junctions. And it's funny now with the benefit of of being a little older and a little grayer to look back and realize how young that really is but to your point in in some ways it's a huge advantage because you don't know what you don't know and you're just kind of forging uh you're forging ahead and clearly you didn't let the lack of a, of a college degree at that point in time slow you down at all uh it was a lot of gray not a little a lot grayer all gray um <laughs> and look and I, I i i i think i was misleading at first i i had my resume that i went to santa clara and i probably put dates in there and i eventually thought no why am i lying about it i don't have to lie right right but I was at a chip on my shoulder. One was I, I had gender issues that, that, that bothered me that I could never resolve because I, we lived in the suburbs and in a time where I didn't, I knew one person that was gay in high school, um, didn't know what trans was. Uh, and then I dropped out of college and that was in, in my mind, another failure. And then I came from a fairly poor background family wise. And so I had three, three things that just put a massive chip on my shoulder, kind of gave me the impetus to work my ass off. And I figured I'll never be smarter than anyone else in the room. Um, but I will probably be able to work harder than all of them. And that, that was kind of what I did. Right. And you worked hard. I mean, you, you were globe trotting all over the place, running all these companies. Um, I think you, you have the, the triplets, right? Triplet girls. Um, <laughs> they'll be 34 this year and I have a 20, a 24 year old daughter who will be 25 this year. So four daughters. Wow. Sometimes, sometimes I blame this on them. I said, it's because of you guys that I'm like this. <laughs> They're not well, amused with that. So. Yeah, well, I want to get on a, a couple of, of your business philosophies and we'll, we'll talk about some motor stuff. But one of the things that came up when I was watching, uh, I think some of the Athena stuff that they do have published is you talked about something and you said it over and over and over and a number of different things about the tyranny of the urgent, you know, and, and Michael Dell loves to talk about 90 day shot clock in the, in the context of a public company, especially when he went private before he went public again, but I've never heard it described so well as the tyranny of the urgent. Cause the other piece you talked about in one of those sessions was about being transactional versus strategic and really shifting your mindset, especially as a leader, as a CEO, to be way more strategic and way less transactional. Where does that come from? Uh, you know, is that one of your kind of foundational, uh, you know, management philosophies and strategies? Well, I, I wish I could I take credit for coining the term itself, but but I, I can't. Um, a gentleman uh, at Rockwell CMC company that I worked with who ran marketing, he was the one who, who came up with that. But what I've noticed when I was working, when I was running companies, it's so you're so busy and there's so many things to do. And and I like to fill my day up and I, I'm very transactional. Sometimes I'm less thoughtful than I should be. And what, I, what I've learned over time, my different jobs was, um, you know, having the having time to sit back and take a break from work, you come back to work differently. And I realized I spend so much time getting stuff done that I don't always think deeply enough about what I'm getting done or what I should anticipate or who I should hire next or a, a number of things. And so it's it's kind of forced me over time to slow my work, to, it slow my mind down a little bit. Um, and I get more done this way. It, it, it's it's counterintuitive, but if I'm when I'm less transactional, I end up getting more done because what I get done is a bit more important. It's I always tell people as well, focus focus on the, what's important. 
focus right. on what matters most. Not not you know not the you know, not 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 the cutlery, but the fact that we have a jet engine getting us from from coast to coast. Not that we have plastic cutlery. So that, that's kind of my view. Yeah. Well, the other thing, just you just triggered it as you talked about the jet engine. And one of those things is it must it must have been maybe it was your HR, uh, your former HR co. Um, co-worker talking about the two engines of the plane in Silicon Valley, which is the engineering team on one side and the sales team on the other side and being so laser focused on those two groups of people to make sure that, because that is ultimately going to be the foundation of your success. Yeah. And it's, it, as, as folk, as managers of companies, we always, you know, we always revert back to our comfort zone. And so when pressured, I will spend a lot of time in the sales with, with the sales organization because that's where my comfort is. Um, when cognizant, I also spent a lot of time with R&D at, at Imperva. We had 400 folks in Tel Aviv, and I was there on a monthly basis. And, and I've realized over time, you know, managing a sales organization is very different from managing R&D, but, but this, the same basic principles are involved. It's, it's you know, what, 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 what's, what is measured in weeks slips in weeks, more or less. So right. it's, the, it's the granularity and and integrity of the, of the of the different inspections that take place that mean whether you're going to ship a product on time or make your quarter. Right, and, right. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the industry that you that you played in for so long, the security industry. Um, you know, I've I've covered RSA uh, for a number of years. You know, before the shutdown. Well, actually, in 2020, you know, 45,000 people. Uh, it's a huge show. Moscone's full of vendors, and yet we still have things like the Solar Winds. Um, uh, breach the other day, and 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 most it seems like most security experts will say you're going to get breached. It's just it's more about what you do when you find out that you got breached versus you know trying to keep those those walls up. You were in the business. Um, how do you kind of view security and kind of the vendor confusion and and how how should should buyers think about security within a, a, a full Moscone of available options and new ones popping up all the time? You know, it's, I, I think. So I think the basic approach to cybersecurity um, has been the same for about a decade. And that is companies like Imperva, like Corelight, you know, when a breach takes place like SolarWinds did, um, it, it's a spotlight. And it's an opportunity for, for all of us to talk about what we would have done differently or how we would have done it differently. And that's kind of too bad because it's a lot of bit of fear-based selling. You, you kind of approach the problem and you, know, you, you go talk to the CISO and say, you know, you don't want to be the, on the cover of the Wall Street uh, Journal or the, or the FT. Um, and here's what we can do to, uh, to help you alleviate that. That is the risk uh, for you. Um, these, C these CISOs, uh, Chief Security Information Officers, they have, they've got a big portfolio of, of products already in use. And about 70% of their budget is usually taken up just with subscription fees to, to do what they're doing, right? So it's, it's and, and there's, there's different classifications of solutions. You've got perimeter firewalls, you've got email security, you've got web app firewalls, database security, um, you, you've got network security, you've got um, endpoint, endpoints, there are all these different pieces. And the technical aspects are all fairly different. So it, what I've noticed is everyone's been waiting for the next big roll up to take place. You know, is when is this gonna go to roll 10 different security companies? It's pretty difficult just because the disciplines are so specific. Right. And so, you know, what we do is we, we all try to vie for the, the top tier. We wanna be in that in your must have, we want to be able to approach a CISO and say, we want, we want to be in your must have list. Right. And you've got all these vendors fighting for visibility, all this noise. And I think it's really, really tough to be a CISO to know where to spend your time. Right. Compounded by the fact that, and and I, I remember top, uh, meeting years ago with the CISO of, of JP Morgan Chase, half a billion dollar budget for security at the time. Um, and being told that it doesn't matter what I spend. I can't guarantee we won't be breached. In fact, he said, we've probably been breached. So I, a lot of the CISOs I talked to and a lot of the executives I talked to in the security domain talked about, so you're probably breached already. You just don't know it yet. So you, right. got, you, but you just don't, but you should operate on the basis that you are already breached. Right. Which, which right. makes it tough, makes it tough. Well, the other thing that, that segue off of that is, is, how to, is how to manage the budget, right? Because, because almost by rule, there is no budget number short of just turning everything off that will be safety. I always think of it as kind of like an insurance problem. And, and you want to have insurance and you want to allocate some percentage of, of your budget to insurance to have some level of safety. But the reality is, you know, you can't completely lock down and you can't spend probably as much as you would like to spend, even though, you know, there's, there's huge potential risk. So when you were, you know, in your CEO hat talking to these CISOs, how are they thinking about, you know, what is the right budget number 
um, for them to, to, to try to figure this out. Well, seriously, they view, in large part, they view security, the security spend as a tax on their business. They have to spend the money. They are going to spend as much as they could get from the CISO, from the, from the, from the management team, from, from the board, from the budget. They'll spend as much as they can. And, and everyone's screaming for more budget money to alleviate certain risk areas. It's, it's just, it's a difficult thing. When, when you know, we're out talking to Coralite customers or when I was in Perma customers, we would talk a lot about our success and, and why certain customers had deployed us and had great success. And we would try to use those, those examples and references as the best way to help our customers or help our prospects become customers. Right. And then this other little thing, the human factors, which is, you know, so often the breaches are caused by, you know, I got an email from somebody that's doing the company newsletter and they need a picture for the, for, of the picnic from last week. Can they get access to my machine? Or, you know, the one that we hear a lot of times now with public clouds is, is, you know, people just leave some switch in the wrong, in the wrong position. And it's, it, it's fascinating. I've, I've talked to the one kind of social engineering um, gal, and she's got a hundred percent success rate on stage at Black Hat hacking whoever she tries to hack purely with a telephone and some background information on these people. So I'm just curious. It must just drive you nuts. You put all this this technology and processes in place, and a lot of times it's a really simple human factors thing that opens up the floodgates. And I think in general, enterprise software and security, it, it's it's a social problem. It's it's can you get these users to deploy? Can you get these users to to, to, to put it in, in, your, in your chain of activities so that you don't have a foot fault. But if you just think about the human engineering and, and the, the issues of don't, don't click on a phishing link, um, make sure you change your passwords. If, if organizations were 100% good there, 85% of the risk would probably go away for security. Right. Which is what, right? Because right. they're having to make, companies are having to make up for all the stuff that, that users do poorly. Right. They, they don't pay attention or they, they don't see what that what that real email address says. Yeah, no, it's tricky. And it's, it's and so funny that the one of the uh, I think it was a Cisco executive gal uh, keynote to last year at RSA and she's talking about clicking. And she's like, we tell people not to click, but everything on the Internet is clicking. Everything we do all day long is clicking. It's like this completely counterintuitive thing. And, and I'm still fascinated that SurveyMonkey still has a business. I don't know who would ever click on a SurveyMonkey. Uh, link nothing against survey monkey but we're still, like you said we're just told don't click don't click don't click unless it's somebody that i absolutely know uh where it came from so it's it's just this really interesting you know kind of constant chasing of the tail keeping up with the bad guys but at the same time you have these human factors things going on which are not a technology problem at all and i, I think that, but i'll go one step further there's a there's a technology that's used um applica sort of application security where we're companies build code that that allows you to find security defects um, and you've got the CISO of some organizations will will ask the r d organizations to, to you know to, to put put an appsec product in in your line of, of code so as you go through the, the deployment you can run the test and you'll know if, if there's a security defect before you deploy that becomes a war it, be, it becomes the r d chief not wanting not wanting to let the it chief or the CISO chief dictate what tools are used. So social problems all around. It really is. It's fascinating. If you get, if you can get rid of the social problems, it'd be a different industry problem, but it would be a different industry. Yeah. It's funny. I was just doing an interview with somebody else on big data projects. And, and basically that was the the same summary. The, the, the biggest problem with, with big data projects is, is people subverting them from the side because you didn't involve them. You didn't engage them. They don't feel part of the process it has absolutely nothing to do with data silos or, or APIs or, or, or anything else. It, it's funny. It always comes back to the human factor. Yeah, if, if your company were just consistent of, of blade servers, that's all you had a whole lot easier. easier to, <laughs> it wouldn't work as well. Let's shift gears again and talk about your, you know, your journey, your adventure. You used to be a B, and you don't look like a, a black wide receiver uh, playing for, formerly for the Pittsburgh Steelers anymore. So uh, that was not a, a great, a great no. nom a nomenclature. Now you're Michelle. Tell us what happened. Give us a little bit of background for people that aren't familiar with the story. Sure. So in 57 years, I was Anthony Betancourt. I was uh, 35 or 37 years in the Valley as a B. Um, and since I was small, I've been hiding something. I like, never understood it. And because I grew up in a certain point of time when the internet wasn't around, I didn't know what I was. Um, and I, you, know, you, you think the worst of it because you feel so awkward and isolated, even in public. And I was that way my entire life. And I, um, 
you know, married when I married when I was 21. My wife and I were married. First off, we were married about nine years, nine and a half years. We had children. Um, we divorced. Um, I married again, as did she, and and I had three uh, uh, another child. So I, I wanted to wait until my children were grown, um, till I hoped they might be able to understand at least what I was trying to describe, which was difficult because I didn't even know what I was describing at the time. Right. Uh, uh, my wife's first wife didn't know. My my wife of almost 28 years didn't know. It was, it was my big secret. So what, what was the kind of normalization thing that happened when you, when you did say, I'm not, I'm not alone. I, I see some other clues as to what's going on out here. Well, it took, it took me a while. Cause my, my, like my work life was this, I would fly into a city um, as CEO of a business and I would get up to my room and I would shower, shave, and I, I would go down the bar, but I would go down the bar looking different, you know, at the time, I had wigs, and but that was when I was working a while ago, and I'd sit and I'd I'd work, I'd do my, I'd work downstairs on email, and that was my life. Um, and I learned over time that interacting with people I was happier, like this, interacting with people than I was the other way. And I, I was almost, it wasn't a different person, but I, but I was a whole lot more outgoing this way than I was as a B per se, um, and I. And I got so used to it that it became my my normal. Uh, and and as odd as it is, as odd as it is to even think about now, it's what I did and it's what I was. And I realized over time that in certain circles nobody cared. I mean, I had friends in New York that that had met uh, Michelle eight times and they met Anthony because I had to be I'd be in town and I wore a suit to a meeting and I'd take them to dinner and they were stunned. They didn't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, but but after time, I, I kind of ran out of you know living a double life is is fine until it isn't. And mine was a real double life. And I ran out of runway. I didn't know what to do. And my assumption was it was going to be a disaster. It, I was fresh off the heels of my father passing away. And, and, um, and I loved my father so much that I, I, I told him toward the end. And he was so, he just said, you look kind of, I showed him a picture, you look kind of pretty. And it was like a month before he passed. That's all he said. And that was it. And, and when he passed, I thought, you know, life is short. And I, 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 I'm going to do this. And right. so I, I went off to New York. I bought an apartment and I, I started my life there. And thankfully over a couple of years, you know, I'm back, I'm back home here in Pleasanton with my wife and everything's fine. Um, but it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a very messy, messy time for me. I, when I, I learned a lot, but, but boy, it's, I, I hate to think about it. Can't yeah. I guess so that you probably wouldn't be so great if you weren't trying to do two, two double life at one time. I mean, being a tech company CEO, especially a public tech company CEO with, with the pressure of the 90 day shot clock that we talked about earlier is a really, really hard job and super um, in, in terms of just taking all your time, right? Especially, you know, you run a global company. So, you know, I, I don't know your routine, but I know you got to get up early to do the Euro calls and you stay up late to do the, uh, the Asian calls and, and you were traveling around the world. That must have just been brutal to try to keep all those balls in the air. Well, you know, it, it, it was, and it's, it, it, there's a bit of, there's a bit of game theory in it for me, but I remember I did a, I had an interview with Bloomberg television and to be there at 6 AM in San Francisco. Um, when I was the CEO of Imperva and it was, I was branded the, the trash talking CEO because of something I said about IBM. And I remember being out until 1.30 that morning as I wanted to be and went back to my room, showered and got a few hours sleep and got out of my suit. And I remember being there just making sure I didn't have any mascara in. And it was just, it's, it's, it is taxing. And my last year of work at Imperva when I was CEO, I think I, I, I stepped down in July and I had 300,000 miles on United at that point. In, in 2017, before I stepped down, 300,000 in half a year. Yep, it was. I was. I was traveling to Tel Aviv all the time. I, it, I had 1,200 employees. Uh, it, yeah, it was. I was always on the move, and I be. I think I became a little bit of an adrenaline junkie because I loved the activity, which kind of gets back to I was. I was great at transactions. I was wonderful at them. I wasn't always good at the, you know, deeper thinking part. And I've did been, you ever just burn out and just have to like disappear for a couple of days and just sleep? You know, I, I really didn't. And, and which, you know, at the time, my, my lifestyle was a bit messy. And so the fact that I could go a couple of days without sleep probably wasn't a good thing. Um, I, I loved work and I, and I loved being me. And I, and I would, that, that was it. I, I could fly in, I'd be me at night. I'd, I'd kill it at work. I enjoy what I did. I would I'd be 24 seven on email and stuff. Right, right. And it was, it was, for it was great for me, but it did a couple of things. It, it fulfilled my ego to 
I love to be in charge. I, I, I don't want, you know, I like to lead if I can. And it gave me a chance to be me. And right. it ticked both of those boxes for me. And you made a few bucks and got to take care of the family and, and uh, held it together pretty well. So what happened at the, what happened when you ran out of runway? What, what caused the change? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's probably not, um, you know, I was, I was dressing at work. I was, uh, you know, and I, we, there was an event I'd, I'd, I'd show up at. I remember one, one event, my, my PR person came in and said, should I, did I, should we get an announcement about, should, do we have to announce anything? I said, like, what? She said that you're transitioning. And, you know, and she was right. I, I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't get it. I just thought, I didn't know what I was doing. But I thought about that last night. That she was spot on and, I, and, and we should have probably done that. But I did, didn't have the courage to tell anyone at that point. Right. And, 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 you know, at some point it got out, I, I was a little bit sloppy on social media or I didn't care. And, um, an investor took a, took a sizable stake in the company and knew, um, because of the, the research work they did before they took their position and had, he had a conversation with one of the board members and then it, it just unwound on me pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting to contrast because you've shared other stories about the support that you got, um, from people at the company, you know, oh, from the people that know you and have known you forever, you know, it's interesting that that they were very supportive of 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 not your tip, you know, atypical behavior, um, you know, not typical, and and yet it was this outsider who you know who kind of blew the whole thing up. I, and I I understand in retrospect, I was look, I was upset at the time, um, but they were doing that because they had they made a sizable investment. They were watching my social media, and I looked reckless. Right, and, and I think that. I understand that. I don't like it, and but they were right. And so I, I went through a period of about, about a two, couple months at work where the board and I had a lot of discussions and we had a plan to go hire a president and I would stay in New York and be the CEO. And the more and more I thought about it, that was doing the company a disservice. If hire a president, they'll need training wheels to become CEO. I don't wanna be CEO forever. I wanna be able to be me. And we kind of ended up bringing on a new CEO. And, and what I was, it was, you know, I'll tell you where the company was brilliant is yes, I was, it was awkward for me at first when you, all your board members are calling you saying, why didn't you tell us? And I thought, why didn't tell you? Well, why didn't you tell us you were trans? That's, that's, I don't know how to respond to that sometimes um, other than it's not your business, but it kind of was and it's, because it's a public company. Right. But no one told me to leave. In fact, everyone asked me to stay. The, the board asked me to stay. It was my decision to go because I did not, I wasn't in, a, in a, the right frame of mind to lead the company. I was becoming a distraction for the company. And that's not a CEO's, CEO should, should leave when they become distractions. They can't can't do that to people. Right, right. So it's it's a, a fascinating story, and congratulations for you. And I'm sure you're you know you're thrilled to not have to you know kind of lead the double life and and kind of keep that under the cover. It must have been a tremendous weight off your shoulders to finally be able to you know take a breath and and not have to to lead the, the double life or or did you miss the adrenaline <laughs> miss the adrenaline you know, you know I, 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 don't, I didn't at all in fact i, I look at what's what's with COVID. um you know, i i got i came back to california late 2019 full time and i well, look i love to go out i i had a great makeup person and, and hair and makeup in beverly hills and i would or i'd I look like an Upper East, Upper East Side socialite sometimes, um, but I don't. But it was I was also taking thirty percent of my time just thinking about the schedule. How am I going to get out? Where am I going to go? I don't have to. I wake up in the morning. I'm me. I don't have to worry about it. Um, some days I put on makeup. Sometimes I don't. It doesn't matter. I'm no longer my own event, if you will. Right. And that's right. giving me. You know, talk about the, the the time transactional versus deeper thinking. I have time now to think, and it's I love it. So it. now, so now, now you're out and, and that's great. And, and you're Michelle and you're helping other people as, as part of your own kind of career progression. You've got a really unique perspective, right? That most people don't get, cause you can kind of see it from both sides. And I, and I think it was one of those talks you were given at the Athena Alliance. I want to, I want to touch on two topics that come up all the time. One is imposter syndrome, right? And we hear about imposter syndrome all the time. It's way more pervasive, I think, than anybody gives it credit. I think it's just a natural thing that that we always are a little suspicious that maybe we're, we're not in the right place or maybe we're not as qualified as the person next to us or across the table. Um, so I wonder if you can share your thoughts about imposter syndrome, you know, more when you were younger, because, you know, you dropped out of Santa Clara and, and maybe you just didn't give a shit. Or did that give you the chip on your shoulder um, to really drive, you know, kind of, you know, an Excel maybe a little harder than you would have had you not had that chip on your shoulder? Oh, I, I think it, it, it gave me the drive. I was embarrassed. I mean, as I said, I was 
I had my gender stuff going on. I we were poor, and now I dropped out of college. I I was I was I had three failures, and the only way to power through those failures was to prove myself wrong, if you will. Right. So I I got really fortunate at work. I I you know I made some mistakes, but by and large, I had I I moved quickly up to the ranks. But I've always felt that I've, that someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and say you're not good enough or you shouldn't be here. Like I feel that way now. I I, I talk to boards of directors. I'm so critical of myself in these conversations. Like, you know, I've, I've always fixed myself to a band of business between 30 million and 300 million. I know what to do in, in that, in that, that, in that target range. You get me outside of, get me outside of that. I'm probably not as effective. Um, right. Right. And I'm, you know, if any, and I, the doc, I did this documentary, which, which won two awards. We, um, we took it to two festivals in 2018. It is my, it's like having your worst home movie. Um, all, right, the, all your failures are your worst possible year um, front and center. I use that as a way to quality, as I'm, when I'm talking to new boards or, or, or new opportunities, I'll ship that after, because every, every first meeting is good, right? Every first call is good. See, that's easy. It, but I'll, I'll follow up with the, with the film and say, please watch this. If you can't stomach how bad I look here, just tell me, I'm good with it. And we'll, we'll, we'll partner up ways. I don't want us to fall in love. And then in six weeks, realize we've got a problem. Right. Um, so we'll come back to, we'll come back to the movie in a minute, but the, the other, the other thing I wanted to mention that again, you have a really unique perspective. And, and again, you talked about the Athena thing is, is walking into a room uh, in, in a business context um, and how you were received as Michelle versus how you were received from AB, just another white executive from Silicon Valley. That's a pretty unique um, opportunity to actually be able to see it and, and live it and, 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 and get it viscerally. Um, and then to be able to share and, and empathize with people because you've seen kind of both sides of the, of the coin. And it's, it is very different. Um, AB was uh, kind of invisible. Yeah, I kind of was. I was kind of quiet. I got stuff done. I enjoyed work, and I kind of went my went by my um, and did what I had to do. Um, this is I come in. I come into room, and at the first there's confusion. Um, if they don't know me at all, they'll they'll do a search on Michelle Betancourt. And what you you know you just you know prior to my core light experiences, there wasn't a whole lot of business in there. There was a lot of pictures of me in New York, and a lot of pictures of me out, and and being my dog and stuff, fun stuff, but none of it that qualified me to be CEO. Right. Uh, but you know, this time around, it's it's. There's two things that happen in so, in some environments. It becomes a discussion around diversity and inclusion. That's 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 the that's the pivot when they see me. Oh, let's talk about that because that's probably what you're interested in. And I try to get people back to the you know kind of first principles is like, I'm um, I'm trans, just like I brown eyes. I and I could never hit a, a curveball in the league. I mean, it's 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 an attribute, um, but it's not it's not my identity. I mean, I identify as a trans woman, but that's that's a piece of me, but that's not all of me. And so I try to lead with, um, I got four kids, married, have a good life, normal life. I've got all this good experience in business. I've got a little bit of musicianship, a little bit of movie stuff. I focus on the bigger picture, and I, it, and being fifty seven, it means that sometimes I'm probably not a very good trans person. And what I mean by that is. I will do things that, that that younger folks won't. When I introduce myself at Corlite, I I put up Michelle Betancourt pictures and then and talked about the fact that there's nothing in these that qualify me to be exec chairwoman here. Then I put up Anthony pictures and there was confusion there. And I explained this was me. Um, same same inside, same brain, just better hair, better packaging. <laughs> And more public, because I got to tell you, in preparing for this interview, as I do for all interviews, right, first thing you do is go to Google and, and and start searching around to see what I can find. And I especially always look for video because I just love hearing people speak in their own in their own voice and, and seeing their mannerisms. You get a much better feel for person. And AB does not have uh, a lot of digital exhaust, as I like to say, out there. I mean, you were you were running these companies, you were successful with these companies, but these weren't big, flashy big flashy companies, you know, you weren't, you know, Yahoo, you know, breaking records on the NASDAQ, not, not as a, not to diminish it at all, but, but you didn't have a big kind of presence outside of your role as the, as the CEO of the company, where now it seems like, you know, you're, you're, you're branching out a little bit more, you're, you know, kind of uh, spreading your wings in terms of, of reaching out and helping people. And as a, and as a, an artifact of that, or as a consequence of that, you know, you now maybe 
I don't know, you know better than me, have more stuff out in the, in the ether uh, as Michelle than AB ever did. I, I do. And my wife, my uh, kids me, and she says that if she didn't know me better, she would have thought I would have done this to extend my career. Um, but, and, and because look, there's changes in the NASDAQ, uh, uh, Israeli, California rules about board governance. So diversity is important. Um, I stayed away from tech for a couple of years because I was positive I'd never get back in. Um, and I, I get all these calls from Anthony Betancourt and I'd, I'd call, I'd return them and I'd say, Hey, it, Anthony's no, not lo no longer here. I replaced him. Um, um, can I help you? And you get crickets on the other side. And I, that's fair. And then when Corelight called and, and there wasn't crickets and I said, yes, we know. Um, it just, it just changed me. It, it gave me, it gave me the thought that, okay, I can get back in and there's a lot I could do. And I'm look, I'm grateful for the opportunities and it's, I'm stunned candidly at how, how good it's been for me going back. Yeah. To I'm, I think, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I straddle three areas. I, you know, I was part of the, and I'm not trying to be pejorative, but, but the, the, the old boys network um, in the Valley. Um, I was always kind of a member, but never felt like I was. Um, but so I'm, I'm still a little bit, even like this, and I thought I wouldn't be. Um, Athena, uh, you know, Coco invited me to, to join the organization. I was stunned. I thought, well, you, you're going to let a, a trans woman join your organization. And I was so happy and relieved and grateful. Right. And then there's the LGBTQ, you know, as, as, as it's called, you know, some, some call it the uh, alphabet mafia. Um, there's that as well. And, and I, so I straddle all three. And it, it's a brand new experience to be in all three at once. Right. Well, the other kind of interesting interesting thing just comes to my mind. A lot of times, you know, when I was at the Cube, we had a women in tech feature specifically every Wednesday. We had women in tech Wednesday and we would feature a woman. And sometimes we would just pull an interview and sometimes we would have a special interview if we didn't have have something in the can. And and some women just don't want to go to the diversity side. You know, they feel um not that it's the meaning, but that, you know, they want to talk about business and they want to, they don't want to just get pigeonholed. You, again, you're kind of in this unique, um, in this unique perspective where, you know, you can, you know, kind of raise those concerns and not necessarily be concerned about not being respected as a business person. Cause you already have a track record. You've already got, you've already got ink on paper and you've rung the bell and you've, you've, uh, you know, you've had some success. So it's, it's kind of an interesting opportunity for you to, to talk more vocally about diversity and not be concerned that people are only looking at you around the diversity card, if you will, versus you know being a, a very talented and and longtime you know successful executive. And I enjoy those conversations, and I'm learning. Um, again, I was in my own bubble for 57 years, and I, I didn't tell that many people, so I I didn't understand what I was, and I had no idea what it would be when I came out the other end. Right. So I, I did the diversity stuff's so important. Uh, I, I did the movie in large part because I was convinced that, that we'd have a 30 year gap before you'd see any openly, before not openly, but trans individuals running companies and, and, and holding significant board seats. And so when I got my first board seat and the others are coming, I was stunned. And I thought this is, I want to do, I want to get out and I want to lead from the front. My wife and I um, are, are forming a foundation um, uh, the, to help encourage fair, fair labor practices for transgendered individuals. I mean, it's a, the, 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 the work situation for, for, for most trans is, is untenable. You're, you've got at least a quarter have been um, lost their jobs because of, because of bias. And there's a large number of states, more than 20 that make it, that make it legal to fire you if you're gay or trans. It's crazy. Wow. Wow. And, and then, then you have all, all the, the, the open you know, hostility, the workforce threats that take place. And I, if I could get out and lead from the front and help that, I'd like, I'd like to do that. So I, right. I speak when I can. And again, I'm, I'm very grateful for the, for the opportunities. Again, what a really interesting, you know, change in your life from, from hiding it to now being, you know, retired from operational roles. So you've got, you've got bandwidth and now you're out. So you don't, you're not hiding anything and you can put your, uh, put your talents and your skills and your, you're obviously tremendously successful into into these causes where before, as you said, you were in a bubble, you, you probably didn't even know all these things were even out there. You gotta be feeling good about being in 2021 and not, uh, well, I don't know, 1921 was a pretty crazy time too. Maybe uh, 51 is less less, uh, less good. Uh, it's, I've, I've, um, I've never been so happy in my life. Um, and it's, it's nice to wake up and, and, and feel level and, and not feel like I'm hiding something and not feel like I'm trying to game someone so I can get my way for, for an ulterior motive. Um, it's, 
it's I can't ex explain how good it is. And and work has been work's been fun. It's fun to see how people react. And it's I'm not and I mean this in a, in a good comical way. I'll, I when I go when I went in the coral, I explain. Look, I, my pronouns are she and her. Right. So, but but I'm I have four daughters and I'm their father, and I have a wife and I'm her husband. And so you almost need a scorecard to keep track of me. And I've told all my old, my longstanding friends, if you'd rather call me Anthony, and here's where I, I run afoul of, of certain organizations, if you'd rather call me Anthony because it feels more comfortable to you, go for it. You want to call me A, B, fine. I prefer M, B. It's one letter lift and shift, but but I don't get caught up in this stuff because I'm just happy right now to be me. I'm right. thrilled to just at, at age 60, realize that life has never been so good and I've never been so happy and fulfilled. That's great. That's great, Michelle. So looking down the road, thank goodness we turned the calendar on, on, on 2020 and, and, and vaccines are starting to, to roll. So I think there is uh, hopefully light here at the end of the, of the rainbow. What are some of your priorities now? You said you just, you just moved back to the, to the Bay recently. You're super active on Athena. What do you, and you just talked about some of the things that maybe I'm answering our own question, but you know, kind of what do you, what are you looking forward to over the next year or so? And then a little bit further uh, down the road. So the, um, I, I think the, my getting back into tech is, is really good for me. It, and I'm enjoying the ability to kind of share experience with other CEOs. And that's what, what I tend to do in, in most of these uh, situations is I've got, I've seen a lot of things over the years and I've, I, I know a little because I've seen a lot and I can help see around corners and help a lot of organizations maneuver things that they don't even know are going to hit them. And so that's, I do that. And that's, that's fun. And I, I love the boards. I do a lot of pro bono advising of companies as well for smaller. Um, I'm enjoying my Athena. I really enjoy that. That's a really important thing to me. I want to, I want to stay on the salon schedule. And I, I like taking meetings um, as, as other members ask. Um, I've got uh, my foundation that as soon as we get the five, the IRS certification, that'll get formally launched. It'll just be my own, our own family money. It'll be a lot of grant writing, giving money for grants at first for those organizations that promote fair transgender employment practices. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the documentary briefly. I've got a, a, t a scripted TV series in development um, with two really well-known uh, known production companies, uh, three, two really well-known actors as the anchors and a, a very famous director. And we're we're, we've got we've got a bit of work to do, but I'd like to think that we'll see something hopefully out of that a green light up for a project in the next three months. That's so great. A, a lot of things going on. A lot of it's fun. Um, I'm learning every day, and um, it's exciting. It really is. That's great, Michelle. Well, you know, you got a ton of energy. Turning around companies is not is not easy, and it's not always pleasant, and and it takes a special skill. So, uh, you know, to now to be able to, to to free up those talents to to apply to these great causes is you know tremendous and and, and good for you. Thank you so good. much. That's good. It's a uh, it, 2021 is going to be a great year. 2020 was the best year of my life. 2021 will probably be better the way it feels. All right, good. Well, hopefully we will get to uh, to meet in person at an Athena event before the end of the of the calendar year. I'm thinking I'm thinking we can meet as uh, as face to face. Hopefully before the end of this uh, end of this calendar year, vaccines are rolling. I would love that. I really would. Thank you so much for having me. By the way, this is thank wonderful. you, Michelle. It's great to meet you, and um, it's great. You know, fascinating story. Glad it's it's all kind of worked out. I'm sure there was some not pleasant moments uh, along the way, but it sounds like at the end. Uh, things have really worked out well for you. So that's terrific. Well, you, you saw the documentary. So you know what, what a chocolate mess I was for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm much better at this. End of the, of the I don't know how you kept all, the whole thing. I guess thinking, how do you keep all the balls in the air? It, 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 uh, it, it, was a, it was amazing. But the other thing that really comes through in the documentary is your love of people. There was a scene specifically in that, in that show where you are speaking while you're out having cocktails with, with your folks. I don't remember if it was Singapore, some, someplace not in the U.S. And talking about the, especially in time of COVID, you know, the, how important that was for you. Um, and how important it is for a leader, you know, I think generally to show empathy, to show vulnerability, to show humility, and to be a person. And I think your your direct quote from the from the movie is something to the effect of, you know, a perfect day of work is when we go out and 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 have a drink with with the team and we start talking about not work. We talk about kids, we talk about hobbies, we talk about sports, we talk about not work. And so, um, God, I I just I just can't even imagine. Um, you know, the stress that you must have been under trying to to kind of balance these things. You obviously are very good at it, but that must have just been 
uh, nuts at times. Probably make some funny movies. I think I want, work, work, work for me has always been fun. It's never been chasing money. Um, money's always occurred and so it's, it's, the bunny arrives, but it's, it's, it's always been about the fun and the, the puzzle of, you know, fix a revenue problem or, or fix a acquisition problem or something of that sort. And I, and I enjoy people and if you're, you're, you spend 12 hours a day at work and if you flip it, how much time do you really spend at home? You're, you're, you spend three hours a night where you see your family during the week. Right. And weekends, you see them a lot of the time, but but you spend more time with people at work. Right. At least know who they are and treat them with respect. And that becomes the glue over time that when things get tough with the business, they stick with you because they know they, they know you care. And, and at least you, you, you've taken steps to integrate the lives, if you will, work life and a personal life, which- right. For me, Jennifer Tahad, I don't know if you know Jennifer, she's a great lady. She, she speaks often of, you know, the fact that, you know, you've got these people working for you for, like you say, 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day, much more than they're with their family, much more than they'd rather be doing other things. So make it worth their while, you know, be conscious, be empathetic, be thinking of the fact that they're doing this for you and the company and the board uh, and the shareholders and, 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 and make sure you make it worth their while, try to make it worth their while um, and give something back. It's not that hard to do. It's not always money. It's look. It's it's time. It's it's a, it's it's a fair appraisal. It's it's a compliment. It's asking good questions. It's being available. It's not always money. It's interesting. Yeah. All right, Michelle. Well, thank you uh, again for uh, for checking in. It has been really fun and great to meet you. And I look forward again to meeting in person, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Sounds good, Jeff. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All righty. She's Michelle. I'm Jeff. You're watching Jeff Rick coming from the home studio. Great to see you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Check. All right. Thank you. Thank you.